So age 24, um, it was the first time I paid for myself to go to Kenya. And I went. Uh, my mum wrote a letter to uh, my father's P.O. box in Nairobi, not knowing whether you know, he would receive it or not. When I landed, he was there in the airport. Wow. From there, I've got goosebumps. From there, he took me out around Nairobi into you know bars and hotels, and everybody knew him and loved him. From the kitchen porter in the back to the general manager in the front, and all the bartenders, waiters, servers, they all knew him, knew what he knew what drink he liked, uh, which is a warm white cap, so a room temperature Kenyan beer <laughs> uh, called White Cap. And you know, I, I just I had this uh, realization in that moment that my even though I didn't really have a, 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 my father didn't raise me at all. Like, you know, I saw him every other year. Um, so, you know, he, he wasn't guiding my career choices right. or career path or life in general. Right. Um, that's not a negative, it's just how it was. And uh, I, real, I realized on this kind of bar crawl around Nairobi that my path into and through hospitality had been preordained. The, the universe had, guided me exactly where I needed to go. This episode made possible by Restaurant Systems Pro. With excitement, allow me to introduce you today's guest brand marketing specialist at Coruscant Co. And that's all so much more before that. I mean, it, it doesn't stop there. No, there's but, a lot. Uh, yeah, we're going to unpackage that in a second. John Gakuru, my man, John, are you feeling unstoppable today? I've never felt more unstoppable. Dude, I'm psyched to have you here. Ross Simon turned me on to you. He said, if you're in Los Angeles, you, you got to talk to my boy, John. I'm here after just doing like, I give myself an hour to research my guests, just to get an idea of who I'm talking to. And you have a unique path, my friend. Um, cruise ships, selling, like you've been traveling, educating people, selling sp spirits. Um, you started off at Fridays, but like today, where are you? Paint the big picture. Like, what are your assets today? Like, what is your business today? So today I am the CEO and founder of Coruscant Co. Uh, I have a business partner, also CEO and founder in Australia. Her name is Emily Weldon. Coruscant Co. is a global drinks and hospitality agency specializing in several niche areas. Uh, those are um, bringing craft spirits from around the world into the US, Canada, Mexico and the Caribbean and Australia. Um, and working on building those brands in those markets. Okay, so you don't just stop at supplying, you really help craft brands around the spirits that you have in your portfolio. Is that what's happening? Um, yes, every brand owner, every spirit brand owner has a different need. Um, so we pride ourselves on being nimble and flexible enough to meet those needs. So we meet the brand owners where they are and we build the brand, we help get those brands launched in the US, um, Canada, Mexico, and the Caribbean, and Australia. Um, and we work with the brand owners to craft their stories, but tell those stories in those markets in the way that the markets will respond best to them. Yeah, and I'm excited to share your story because the one thing that I want to communicate with this podcast is that there is no one path. There's a million different paths you can take in this industry and become successful. There's so many adjacent industries that spin out of the restaurant and hotel industry, hospitality industry. So I'm really excited to get your story. Before we dive into who you are and how you got to where you are today, let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quarter mantra. What do you got for us? So I, I have a, a couple. Um, there's, there's a couple of quotes from, from famous people. One is from... I think the one that governs my life in the in the both my personal and professional life in the most complete and wholesome way is a quote from Nelson Mandela: "I never lose; I either win or learn." Ooh, that one that one, one would get me out of bed on those tough mornings, you know. And yeah. I, I need to I can I can then assess what it is I've learned from any you know adversity or things that didn't go my way. The other one, which um, is a little more recent, I guess, but I've I've certainly been uh, spouting it for, for a good few years now is feedback is a gift. Mm. It's a very simple handful of words, but in my six and a half, seven years in America, quite often people are not open or receptive to feedback. If you train yourself to be open and receptive to feedback, it is a gift. How do you train yourself to do that? Because a lot of people get very defensive if they're if they're being told if they right. if the feedback is not what they want to hear, right. people get their backs up and get defensive. If you allow that feedback into your heart and mind, 
um, you can do something about it. And that feedback might be joyously positive. Yeah. But um, it also might not be what you want to hear. So this is something that you've been saying for years now. Years. I actually got it from uh, one of my one of my mentors. It's it's not my line. Um, I worked for an amazing gentleman by the name of Patrick Borg in Australia, um, which we'll get to uh, later, I'm sure. Uh, it's it's one of his, um, oh, yeah. and he he taught me the power of being open to feedback whether you want to hear it or not so as you're sharing this with people and you're giving them constructive criticism one of the fee- the bits of feedback you're giving is be better at getting feedback what's the mindset that you're sharing with them to help them wrap their mind around why it's a benefit thing a beneficial thing well in, in hospitality none of us will ever know everything we should always be open to listening and learning um, if you're not open to listening and learning because you know it all then I, I'm pretty certain I don't want to be in your bar or restaurant. Right, right. And it's the same mindset, I think, that goes with online reviews. Sometimes as painful as those can be to absorb and hear, it's also if you see patterns, maybe there's something happening here that we should pay attention to. Absolutely. Uh, be, be open to it and try not to like lose your total sameness when reading that stuff. I know it can be tough. <laughs> I know it can be tough. But well, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, know, lovely reviews from this podcast. Yeah, I can't wait to dive, dive into it. But I feel like before we really dive into your story, too, we need to pay a little homage to this beautiful restaurant we're sitting in today. Where are we right now? So this is this is one of my favorite restaurants in L.A. It's called Gracias Madre. Uh, it's right on Melrose in West Hollywood. Um, they have been an incredible supporter um, and champion of some of the brands that, that I represent. So in our agave portfolio, this is one. Uh, Ojo de Dios, Mezcal. Um, Gracias Madre was the very first venue in the United States of America to place an order when we launched. Oh, wow. Um, so this this venue has had a place in my heart since opening. Um, the the beverage director, Sean, is a, is a really good mate of mine. and, and he's Super accommodating. Oh, my God. I, I Please, when you come to Los Angeles, come visit Gracias Madre. Yes. It's plant-based. Um, and as a result, all of the decisions about all of their products go through a, a very, a very particular um, matrix before they make it onto a table or into a glass. Yeah. Um, and so all of the brands that are represented on the back bars here um, have gone through quite a tough um, kind of process to ensure that they are what they say they are. Um, and what makes that special when you're building brands is every every customer, every guest that walks in here is making a conscious choice about what they put in their body. So they are they are open and receptive to listening and learning to anything that the venue um, that Gracias Madre has to sell them or tell them. Yeah, and I just want to give one more uh, push towards the, the gratitude. Uh, Sean, or John and I have already been together for two hours now. Uh, we had a venue lined up. There was an extension cord that was causing an issue, so we relocated. Sean was so uh, gracious and just m- made it happen. We just walked in, and they're, they're accommodating us. So a special thanks to these folks. And um, before we get in, do we want to talk about this real quick? Oh, uh, what do you have for us? Okay, this so is so many treats, so many things to talk about before we get started. Right. So the, the margarita that I'm drinking is a mezcal margarita with the Ojo de Dios Joven. This is our Ojo de Dios Cafe. So this is a coffee mezcal. Um, we have a coffee and a hibiscus flavored mezcals. Um, they are the world's first flavored mezcals as, with protected denomination of origin. Um, in this case, the coffee comes from Veracruz, roasted, ground, um, steeped in the pre-dilution Joven for 40 days. Um, a little bit of sugar, 8% of natural uh, Mexican cane sugar called piloncillo is added, filtered, ABV stabilized to 35, bottled. Dude, that's it. I'm assuming this is a sipper. I mean, no? unless, unless you're all grown up. <laughs> okay, we should. <laughs> no, no, I, gonna... I, I, li- I like, it's it's whatever you want it to be. Well, cheers you know, we, to we're, whatever. Cheers, am thank I, you. Am I, I'm matching you, man. Am I putting this thing back? No, no, no. Okay. No, no, we're not encouraging overconsumption. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be fun. All right. Where does it make sense to start sharing your story, story man? Bring us back to the beginning. Um, okay. So I, I've, this, this story is actually in the public domain, um, but I, I tell it whenever I have a, uh, an opportunity like this. So I appreciate, um, I appreciate you coming to, to chat to me yeah, and, man. and getting this thing done. Um, I've been a bartender, um, or I've been in bars and bartending for as long as I have been an adult. I started bartending at age 17. Um, in 2010, I won the Spirited Award for Best International Brand Ambassador. And after I left the stage with my award, um, the beautiful uh, wife of Dale DeGroff, Jill, who paints portraits of hospitality uh, professionals, um, they're really quirky, really inspiring, beautiful pieces of art. 
um, she asked me for a very personal story about myself that no one in the industry would know. So I wrote a very personal story about my relationship with my father. So I was born in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, my mum and dad were never married. My mum's English, my father's Kenyan. And as I was writing this story to accompany uh, uh, the portrait that Jill painted of me, um, I realized that my position and path through the global hospitality industry was a preordained thing. It was already in the universe. Um, I lost touch with my father at around age 18 through 20, my early 20s. Um, my last trip to Kenya with my mother was in, when I was 18. And we used to get a letter every year at Christmas, you know, Merry Christmas from dad. Um, and then, there were, then those letters stopped coming. Hmm. And so neither my mother nor I knew why or even if my father was still alive. So age 24, um, it was the first time I paid for myself to go to Kenya. And I went. Uh, my mum wrote a letter to uh, my father's P.O. box in Nairobi, not knowing whether, you know, he would receive it or not. When I landed, he was there in the airport. Wow. From there, I've got goosebumps. From there, he took me out around Nairobi into, you know, bars and hotels, and everybody knew him and loved him. From the kitchen porter in the back to the general manager in the front and all the bartenders, waiters, service, they all knew him, knew what, he, knew what drink he liked. Uh, which is a warm white cap, so a room temperature Kenyan beer <laughs> uh, called White Cap. And, you know, I, I just, I had this uh, realization in that moment that my, even though I didn't really have a, 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 my father didn't raise me at all. Like, you know, I saw him every other year. Um, so, you know, he, he wasn't guiding my career choices right. or career path or life in general. Right. Um, that's not a negative, it's just how it was. And, uh, I, real, I realized on this kind of bar crawl around Nairobi that my path into and through hospitality had been preordained. The, un, the universe had guided me exactly where I what, needed to go. What was special about this night? What were you feeling that this, for you, was a point of clarity? It's really simple. I, I, I am my father's son. It's that simple or that complicated. Was it when you, is this when you realized that you're your father's son? Yeah. It, was it just a fact what you shared with us that he would go places people knew him so what the, about it like what did the, what is the similarity specifically the, the way he the way he moved through a venue through a bar or restaurant is exactly how i do how did you feel in that moment when you recognized this um or how do you feel reflecting back at it reflecting back on it i mean i just said i, got, I get goosebumps because you know I've, I've worked extremely hard to to be where I am um, and to be doing what I'm doing, which, you know, I feel so fortunate that I, I get to do something I absolutely love every single day. Um, so in that moment in Nairobi, bouncing around bars and, and restaurants with, with my father, I was like, I, I am him, he is me. And there is no way other than the universe making that choice for us that, that I could have been anything else or doing anything else. It, right. it was really, I don't know, it's it quite, it quite profound, but it and was just, cool. Just out of the gates, it sounds like you have this profound, uh, I guess, pride. You're proud of the work you do, which I think is something that we can be better about as an industry. Is that safe to say? Absolutely. I think I, I'm, to repeat myself, I feel so fortunate that I get to do something every single day that I love. You know, there are, there are people that wake up and go to work and hate every minute of their working day and I really feel for them I, I, have, I cannot relate to that set that feeling or that that lifestyle like I, I get to I've worked in 75 countries America is my fifth to call home I get to travel and I only now need to spend time with people I care about right. and, and respect and I think that is a huge lesson if you're a young person or any person listening, listening to this and you're talented and you literally have a ticket anywhere in the world. There's a job waiting for you. You can travel. The, I don't think we know how benef the, the benefits associated with the work we do here. Um, I, I'd agree. I, it wasn't until I was 24 that I made the commitment to myself to be in the hospitality industry. So at 24, and I remember it so vividly, um, it was like, flicking a, a light switch I'm like okay uh, this is it I'm I am in this industry and now I'm going to 
fight to be the best I can be every single day. So at this point, how did you start living differently? Uh, what, what's the year at this point for you? Timeline. <laughs> um, not to date you. 20 years ago. 20 years ago. <laughs> so <laughs> so 20 years ago. So looking back, um, I love LinkedIn. Your LinkedIn is, is great because it gives me a, a really awesome timeline. Uh, so when you started living intentionally, what was the first move? Where's the point of intention bringing you? So, I mean, as we navigate through adulthood and career path choices, there, there are several nodes. So, I, you know, one decision led to the next decision that led to the next decision, if that makes sense. So I can't identify like a pinpoint moment other than that moment when I was 24 and decided to, to focus on, on global or bars and bartending at the time. Rewinding the clock, um, I've only ever applied for one job in my life. And that was my very first job at TJ Fridays, and it wasn't an application. How old were you? Is that 17? 17. Okay. Yeah, it was an audition. They auditioned back then. And was this in where, in, in England? England. Okay. Yeah, in the south of England in a city called Southampton, which is where I went to university. So because I'm from a, a single parent family, my tuition was um, covered, okay. um, but I needed to pay for my accommodation, so I had to work. Across the street from my halls of residence, was uh, an American cocktail bar. So I just went in there, got a job as a glass collector, um, you know, bar back. Um, these guys were very enthusiastic flair bartenders. They were chucking the bottles around and this was, you know, this seemed like a lot of fun and I could at least, at the very least, have fun and earn money and cover my accommodation while yeah. I was at university. So in 2004, you're 24 years old. This is when you're 17. No, I wish, I was 24 in 2000. Oh, in 2000, yeah. okay. So this is so 24 this is like, years ago. Okay, so this is like mid 90s. We're talking. Thank you. Yes, I, okay. I, I love I love dating myself. Well, just, it's how my mind works. The like chronologically moving forward. Yeah, correct. So I, it's how I stay centered. Nine, it's, nine, not, it's not to date you, I promise. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's how it landed. No. <laughs> so, w you were, how long were you with TGI Friday? Uh, three years. Three years. Yeah. I mean, there's something to be said about getting your, cutting your teeth in a corporation. I think D definitely and. Um, it, it was also, um, personally, it was a really challenging time for me as well. What was um, challenging? Well, I was, I was dealing with my own sexuality at the time. Okay. So I was 17, 18, 19, 20, um, working at TJ Fridays in Southampton at university, building up this whole bank of, of lies and being in the closet and like all, of, all of that rubbish, uh, which is not rubbish if you're going through it. Um, I, I I just got sick of of, of lying to mm. people I really cared about. So my you know my bar team, and I, I just dug myself in this in into this hole. Like I couldn't figure out how to get out of. Then Southampton is the United Kingdom's cruise ship port. So the cruise ships would come into Southampton, and the TJ Friday Southampton was the first decent bar. This is nineteen ninety four five six. Okay. Uh, or five six seven. Uh, it was the first decent bar that you kind of stumbled across outside the cruise ship terminal. Yeah. In the early days, TGI Friday had a reputation. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. It no, was it, was, it was great because back then, TGI Friday's UK was owned by TGI Friday's America. Yeah. So we had uh, an amazing trainer, Philippa. I'll, I'll never forget her. She was incredible. Came over to, to teach and train us. Yeah. I still use some of the TGI Friday's management um, mantras today yeah there's a reason they became the success that is tgi fridays today they that that organization was built on an amazing foundation uh i've heard amazing things about their training their b creating opportunity for others so well, how did you leave tgi friday better paint the picture of who you were when you came in but how you left how are you a better hospitality first person oh my god um i i owe almost everything i i know about making cocktails, hospitality, service standards from TGIs. You know, we had to learn learn them verbatim. Right. And and, you know, it sounds so cheesy now to tell the story, but but you know, I, I can still recite some of the cocktail specs, some of the you know, the, the specs for pina colada mix, you know, like some of these uh, as you move from bartender to head bartender or master bartender and then into management, they they have a stack of kind of very American um you know, business mantras that are kind of gung ho, and we, you know, but what it did for me was everything at TJ Fridays had a why. So, what, where, when, who, how are facts. Why is subjective. So, I, I, John Gakuru, I need, I need to buy into the why before I 
give a shit about the facts. Right. Like this is progressive shit when you think about. It. We're talking mid nineties. Like yeah, you know, like they were leading edge when it came to psychology and training, all these things. Keep Absolutely. I mean, looking back, you might have called it brainwashing if you were, you know, outside well, looking building in, building a but culture, cult. At the end of the day, there's a little bit of Kool-Aid that needs to be sipped if you're trying to do something special. The, the magic for me about about exactly what you're saying is that we there is a, a broadly accepted vocabulary, you know, a language of hospitality, or especially bartending. Um, you know, if something's 86 or 68 or, you know, like these, these sorts of terms gave us a language that was ours, you know, and we became... A, a little a subculture, club, yeah. a, a little group of a little community yeah. of bartenders with our own language that was kind of secret, but didn't need to be. But it was kind of fun anyway. Right. Um, and because of that, I, I had this kind of alliance with a group of like-minded bartenders who, in the end, didn't give a shit about my <laughs> my sexuality or, you know. But we went to work. With, the bar was a stage. We acted for eight hours, we wiped down the bar, we had a beer together at the end of the shift and went home. And it's honestly that level of not giving a shit that is the reason why I love the restaurant industry uh, so much. It's like, you are who you are, take me or leave me. You know, like... I, I, I Yes, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, no. I absolutely agree. Yeah. It, it is, come as you are, and if any venue, any venue has an issue with who I am, then they don't get to enjoy my money. Right. You know, it's really that simple and that complicated. Yeah. I... I aggressively reject things like dress codes because the scruffy, the, you know, in Los Angeles, the scruffiest people are the wealthiest. Right. It might be a Balenciaga hoodie, but it's a hoodie nonetheless. So know? where is the line on professionalism then? Because this is something, like, I always say, like, what the fuck is professionalism? <laughs> Throw the, the F-bomb in there to prove a point. I think it's, it's, in my opinion, I think professionalism is your ability to do the job um, and be respected and respect others while you do it. But where does that line get drawn in the restaurant I've, industry? I've, I've got a concise response to that. Please. There is a cigarette paper between arrogance and confidence. Confidence is knowing knowing the tools of your trade and how to use them, i.e. All the, all the different spirits, juices, you know, how to balance a cocktail, not too strong, not too weak, not too sweet, not too sour. You know, all, all of the kind of fundamentals of, of, of bartending lay a confidence and humility on top of each other and I will sit across from you and you're in your bar and open a tab and take my money. There is such, I have, I derive so much pleasure from confident humility. The humility comes from empathy. What is it like to be served in my venue by someone like me? If you can operate at work with that, in that headspace, act. Do your shift. Put on a great show. When the doors close and you're done, change how you feel. That's cool. But hospi great hospitality, great professionalism for me, or, or the difference between that takes you from good to great is confident humility. I love that. Awesome stuff. So three years with TGI Friday, 17 mm -hmm. to 20. Um, then you joined Princess Cruises. Then I ran away to cruise ships <laughs> yeah. uh, to become fabulous. And then, <laughs> so there's still four years before you have this this coming uh, this yep. moment with your, your your father. So what was the continued evolution for you during this time, this four year period? So <clears throat> this my my time on cruise ships was was pretty selfish. It was about me. It was about finding finding my voice, finding my confidence. Um, was this like an inner, like an inner search with what we discussed before, just coming out? Was yeah, it that's, okay. yeah. My 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 own um, struggle with my own sexuality. Like okay. there was no internet, there was no smartphones, there was no grinder. It was you hard know, there to was find no, your people. Yeah, and, and I didn't know who my people were because none yeah. of them looked like me. Right. You know, so it took um, it it didn't take very long. Uh, I the bartenders that came into TJ Fridays uh, off of cruise ships would come in every Saturday or Sunday, every time the ship was t turning around, turn around day. And uh, eventually like, John, you've got to come and work with us on ships. You'd love it. We get to travel the world and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, great. Put your money where your mouth is. Motorola flip phone came out, click, tick, 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 tick. It was like, call your boss um, and get me an interview. And they did. Um, so I said the only, I've only interviewed for one job. That was a lie. I interviewed for my job at TJ Fridays. I walked into the interview for my Princess Cruises job and as soon as I was introduced to, to the hiring manager, they 
agreed to hire me. So I didn't really go through an interview. I walked in and got the job. Okay. What was that? What was that? That that first point of contact like when you walked through? What happened? What, um, why, why was it love at first sight? So the beverage director who was doing the hiring um, had been brought in. He was ex Starbucks UK, and he'd been brought in to elevate the cocktail program on Princess Cruises. So they were specifically looking for folks like me, um, ex TJ Fridays, great training, you know, great. Yeah, they knew where we looked. TJ Fridays back in the day, man. Yo. It was a, it was a, I mean, to this day, it's just still a good organization. Like, but it had a reputation. It, I, it's really, it's really sad that that reputation isn't as strong and, and as meaningful today as it was back then. Um, so you know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to. Yeah. You know, besm- I, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing without TJ. Right. So I have nothing but love and respect. Um, it's hard to scale culture <laughs> and magic. F- write that down. Um, <laughs> very true. Yeah. Um, so th- this guy Colin um, was l- specifically looking for bartender profiles like mine. Um, TJ Friday's master bartender, three or four years, same venue, so was loyal. Like I hadn't bounced around from bar to bar to bar to bar to bar. bar. In my resume was tight. I had two bar jobs: the American Cocktail Bar and then TJ Friday's. Um, and I'd worked my myself. I'd worked my way up. I did my first TJ Friday's bartender shift on my 18th birthday, because that's the legal age in yeah. the UK. And so from there, I went to the Princess Cruises interview. Um, Colin was like. This is you are exactly what we're looking for. We're going to enter you into our fast track promotion program on board. So I had to go from TJ Friday's master bartender to cocktail waiter, but I was on this fast track promotion program. So I got promoted every three months. So a contract is six months. So after three months of being a, a cocktail waiter um, on the Sun Princess out of Fort Lauderdale, I got promoted to junior bartender for the next three months of my contract, came back. On my next contract, did three months as a junior bartender, promoted to senior bartender, um, for the, and then I was a senior bartender for several contracts. Um, then I got promoted to food and, assistant food and beverage, sorry, assistant food and beverage director, bars, and I had to take a massive pay cut. Was this about a year and a half? No, this this took about two years, about two, two, years? two and a half years. Got it. Um, and I didn't, I didn't want to take the pay cut. I'm like, no, you need to leave me as a senior bartender. I don't want the promotion because it was more responsibility for a third of the money. Yeah, is that an issue with our industry? Do you think there's a problem with that? Um, I, um, this is going back to 1997, 98. So um, I can, I can only speak to cruise ships, but everything was cash right. back then. So all the passengers were paying in cash, or you know, now you have an RFI. Uh, RFID chip on your wrist yeah. and you just tap wherever right. you go and you can tip or not like it's all you know uh, it's all as it is around the world now but yeah. Um, yeah back then everything was cash so at the end of a cruise passengers would come and just give you envelopes of cash how much money would you go home after a cruise I'm I, was, curious. I was a thousand thousand dollars a week cash zero cost of living zero tax wow yeah so on paper I was I've probably never earned as much money. Is it zero taxes? You're literally in the open waters? International waters. Yeah, that's cool. Zero um, cost of living. Uniform provided, food and drink provided, a, a double vodka cranberry or vo- you know, vodka tonic, gin tonic, whatever. It was one US dollar in the Would you bar. recommend that lifestyle to somebody who's coming up? Uh, coming up is an interesting choice of words. Coming out... Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, on the come no, no, up no, no, in look, your I, career to get experience. On, honestly, I, I can't... The short answer is, it is an incredible experience to work on a cruise ship. The logistics, the, you know, the, the, the depending on which cruise line, the degree of hospitality um, that is provided is amazing. If I was going to advise anybody about joining a cruise ship, I'd say do your research. Um, probably the most exciting cruise line in our, in our industry for hospitality is Virgin Voyages. Like Virgin is, is 21 plus only. Um, so you're not dealing with kids, you know, lovely as kids are. Um, you know, Disney right. Cruise Line is there for a reason. Um, Virgin is 21 plus and their beverage program and um, global food and beverage director is a good friend of mine, um, Charles Stedman. He's doing an incredible job of bringing the on land contemporary hospitality environments to open waters. And it's really, really, really cool. So that you know, the, the things that we're enjoying today in our in in the global drinks and hospitality industry, like um, you know, 
bar pop-ups and exchange programs and you know such and such from Tokyo is here in Los Angeles popping up at you know such and such a venue and then they reciprocate like Virgin is doing that on a ship as well which is really 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 cool that's cool yeah so um, if you came out of this ex experience better in, in any way what was it how did this help craft the, the professional you became my time on cruise ships yeah um to repeat, I guess it um, cruise ships helped me find my voice. Okay, awesome. help me help me find a way to articulate um, who I am. Yeah, and why I am. So yeah. coming back to why being subject, I need the why. I, I it doesn't. I don't care what the project is, whether it's my my personal life, my professional life, my clients, my you know whatever it is. I need to buy into the why. I need to believe. Right. And cruise ships help me find my own why. Yeah, I mean, without getting into the details of how they helped you find your own why, I don't know if there's oh, stories there. No, it's fine. No, no, no. We'll, we, we, can, we'll, we can keep it PC. PG-13. Uh, I'm happy, but I think it's really important. I'm happy that, you, that this was a time for you to find yourself, and I think it's so important that we take the time to lead ourselves because we can't lead others until we've, I think, completely led ourselves. And we're comfortable and confident in who we are, right? right? Totally. And if you're not comfortable with me, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no, um... So, so what helped me is on a cruise ship. If you t if you imagine a Las Vegas hotel with a you know a flamboyant show in the theater and a bunch of restaurants and bars and nightclubs and hotel rooms, take that Vegas hotel, make it horizontal, put a propeller at the back, and push it out into the ocean. That is cruise ship life. Right. So you've got you know you've got strong, confident you know dancers and performers and musicians, and then you've got chefs and waiters and head waiters and you know and then you've Sounds got like a good time. bartenders <laughs> and then and then you've got all the ho the hosp um, hotel support crew you know you've got um, all of those different industries and professions all literally metaphorically under one roof uh, and then you push them out into the middle of the Atlantic right. and you're like okay now be a pro now entertain 3000 passengers right that sounds like a crazy time it is a it's a crazy time so if and to come back to, to the kind of LGBT thing, um, having found my voice and my confidence, um, I, I, it's, it's become really important to me to ensure that anybody who is struggling with, with their identity, um, that there are, there are always places to turn and friendly people who listen, yeah. me being one of those. Yeah. So if there is anybody, you know, who is struggling with their identity or with a career path choice, you know, please do feel free to reach out to me. You know, I because I've, I've, I've been there um, yeah. and if I can help one person through being on this podcast, yeah. this is a, a phenomenal opportunity. Yeah. And we will share your contact information at the end. So stick around to the end for that information. Uh, so, OK, so you do this for four years till you're 24 years old, 20 to 24, right? Yep. Um, you have this experience with your dad. We don't have to go back into that, um, but that's at this point where you realize, I'm not just doing this for now. This is where I belong. This is this is I am I'm cut from the same cloth as my father. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. How do you start living differently at this point? So I, I don't want to kind of keep rewinding to you know to go forward, but um, my one of my best friends on cruise ships, he and I became um, we, we coincidentally ended up on the same ships doing similar similar contracts, both in the bar, both bartenders. Um, his name is Jody. Is Jody Terrell? Um, Jody has a twin brother, Jamie. Um, Jamie was the bar manager of Lab, L A B, in Soho, London. Um, Lab stands for London Academy of Bartenders. And so, when I eventually quit cruise ships in Barcelona, um, Princess Cruises repatriated me back to London, um, and Jody had told me to go see his twin brother, Jamie, in Lab, and Jamie would do his best to hook me up. I walked in and said, hey, Jamie, I'm your twin brother Jody's best mate from cruise ships. He said you'd hook me up. Jamie said, great, uh, you start on Thursday. And that was January the 9th, 2000. Um, I had no idea how impactful Lab as a bar was at the time. Um, it wasn't until I became the general manager eight months later <clears throat> that I really started to cut my teeth in what we might now consider mixology. It's okay. not, not a word that I really when you, Yeah, liked, when you say impactful, what do you mean? How Impactful on you specifically or the whole culture of our culture? Um, we knew... Okay. So we're now the year 2000. Cocktail culture in London 
um, existed in two forms. It was either <clears throat> TJ Friday's Planet Hollywood Hard Rock Cafe, or it was the Savoy, Connaught, Dukes, you know, white tuxedo, stirred luxury hotel martini. For the elite. There was nothing in the middle. Um, and certainly cocktails were either what we later called disco drinks, so TJ Friday style cocktails. Um, there was no serious craft cocktail movement culture it didn't exist there were two venues in london that changed that one was atlantic bar and grill uh piccadilly circus and the other was lab but we weren't we didn't feel like we were pushing the envelope at the edge of uh you know pushing cocktail culture in a direction it had never been we didn't feel like that we were just having a really really good time really good time we had more fun than our customers quite often, uh, than our guests. And that was a really important uh, emotive response to going to work. So we would go to work, we would work our asses off, but we would have a great time doing it. There was only 10 staff. Uh, in my four and a half years, uh, I worked there for five years, four and a half as uh, general manager. We turned over maybe four waitresses and two bartenders in my entire tenure. Wow. So that's a testament right there. If you could distill it, if you could pun intended, <laughs> not intended, but I should have been. Um, but if you could really, you know, distill that down to what was special about lab, what was lab doing that other people, if they, if they try to do the same thing, they could have a shot at as being as successful. So th there's a couple of things. F first of all, none of the kind of, recognition and awards that exist today existed then there was no 50 best there was no um spirited mm. awards there was no i don't know if you realize you just hit a, a chord with me but keep going sorry <laughs> <laughs> so that stuff didn't exist so we were not we were not chasing anything other than going home at night knowing we had a good time worked hard made great drinks and made guests happy that's it there was nothing it was that simple or that complicated so lab Standing for London Academy of Bartenders had this educational component to it. So as much as we were learning every day, we were also teaching and training our guests on what's possible to mix in a glass. So again, to kind of go back, TJ Fridays and back then, our sweet and sour mix was a powdered sweet and sour mix with powdered egg white and you know powdered lemon and powdered lime. We had powdered lime mix. We had one times lime and two times lime mix. You know. It, Everything, everything was in a sachet and you, you know, you mix. Now at Lab and Atlantic, we were using freshly squeezed. You know, uh, we were talking with the chefs in the kitchen now for the first time. There was that interaction that just started early 2000s. We're like, um, pastry chef, can I borrow some of that raspberry puree and, <laughs> yeah. and like put it in a cocktail? Pastry chef would be like, uh, okay, weirdo. Um, so we we started that exchange yeah. of where it doesn't have to be us versus you but it's like how can we from nose to tail make this an intentional experience well that, that well that's where it is now yeah back then there was no intention it was like that looks delicious yeah let me try putting that with gin and okay. fresh lemon juice and a, some house-made simple syrup from like real cane you know th those we weren't intentional we were we were really having fun messing with messing with what could be mixed together in a glass. Was it intended to be fun? Like, who was the owner? Who was the creator behind this? Thank you for asking. That's great. So, uh, I'm sure everyone on this podcast will be familiar with the porn star martini. The porn star martini. I thought you were going to say familiar with the porn star. I was like, the owner was a porn star. Okay. No, no. <laughs> uh, the porn star martini. It, it is now what we would call a contemporary classic. It is pretty ubiquitous. Okay. You know, <clears throat> I was recently in Ghana, in um, Accra, Nairobi, Cape Town, and Joburg in March with Tales of the Cocktail and, and the Ajabu Cocktail Festival. Um, porn star martini is across the African continent. Like that, it, it has jumped into ubiquity and it's now a contemporary classic. That cocktail was created across three bars. Lab Cape Town, uh, Townhouse in Knightsbridge, which was the sister bar to Lab, and Lab. That's pretty cool. So to answer your question, who owned it? Uh, it was two guys, later a third investor came in. Um, it was Richard and Doug. 
So Douglas Ankara, the late Douglas Ankara, um, was my boss, effectively. You know, he, he was a co-owner of Lab um, and the creator of the Pornstar Martini. So I get very... Um, defensive is the wrong word. I, I really enjoy ensuring that the truth about the... Homage. Yeah, the truth about the, the Pornstar Martini is, is kind of um, disco drinky as it might be considered, and that's fine. Um, it has a heritage, it has a story, and, and the guy that created it is... Um, you know, is a dear friend, mentor, ex-boss, um, you know, may he rest in peace. So, uh, yeah, Doug, Doug Ankara and Rich were fundamental, uh, Richard Hargroves, were fundamental in, in helping me find my kind of bar industry confidence and voice, I suppose. So when I, when I mentioned earlier about those nodes in, in a career, Lab is, is a huge one where... I flicked the switch age 24 when I became the general manager of Lab at 24. I was like, fuck, I'm, I'm, this is, like, I'm, I'm built for this shit. And that's when I went to Kenya. And like all of, all of the, the time between becoming a general manager of Lab, going to Nairobi, having that experience with my father and flicking the switch that this is what I'm predestined to be doing, all happened within maybe six weeks. Yeah. So many questions, man. Um, <laughs> I want to dive deeper into lab, but I also want to dive deeper into you. I feel like you kind of explained your your coming, like your realization when you had this experience with your father. But like, what are the qualities about you that make you a fit for this industry in terms of like your strengths, your your passions, your like like if if we want to know we're a right fit for this industry, like what were you feeling in that moment? Like, what are the things that you're confident about? in yourself that make you so sh sure and certain this is where you belong? Um, given that I've talked about confidence and humility and empathy being three character traits that gotta be I love that. most, <laughs> um, I will do my level best to answer that with those three <laughs> with those three personas, personalities, ways of thinking in mind. So when I... I'll answer the question about why I think this industry is, or sorry, why I know this industry is the right fit for me and what make, what helps me, which parts of my personality help me navigate this industry in the way that I have and that makes me happy. To answer that, uh, the best way I can do it is feedback that I was later given, like years later, about why I'd been successful either in my global brand ambassador job with Sagatiba Kashasa or in my job at Think Spirits in Australia, which we'll get to, I'm sure. But other folks would tell me that, John, the reason the reason that we took Sagatiba into our bar is because of you, not because of the brand. Because you say what you mean and mean what you say. My phone was always on. I was, I would, if I said I would get back to you about something, I would. So I think I developed this, um, I don't think, I know I developed a, trusted persona and personality that if I said if I said something I would honor it um, and that that feels like a, something that's been lost in the last you know through the pandemic and post pandemic you know a handshake is no longer enough um, a contract is no longer enough whereas back then my word was my bond and yeah I, I, I still say what I mean and mean what I say I still work my ass off to deliver if, if I've promised something or said that I do something um, I will stay in communication until that thing is done that doesn't yeah. mean that doesn't mean I down tools and you know go do whatever it is you want me to do it means that I will if I say I'm going to help with something or be there for someone or work wise I'm going to sponsor an event or do a thing I'll do it um, and I'll stay in constant contact um, until the project's through so I, I don't know if that answers the question because I don't want to say, you know, because oh, I'm, a, I'm a sick cunt, you know what I mean? Like it's well, when you get great energy, man. And like I can see even the way that you, you engage the people here where we're, we're recording this podcast and uh, there's a certain type of person. I mean, Danny Meyer calls it the 51 percenter, right? The emotionally intelligent, the socially intelligent, the ability to think fast and to continue along that vein. And, and I think... So my job at Sagatiba took me through more than 70 countries. Um, working with Sagatiba, you have to become a chameleon. 
you know, a shapeshifter. Um, I need to be able to read a room, read a, uh, read a, a, a vibe, a, yeah. a, a, um, an energy. Get it and I, and I need to, and I need to be able to adapt in an instant. So a lot of people today are, I am this. And if you're not with me, you're against me. Yeah. Um, whereas I am far happier to listen to your blah, blah, um, and then adjust my blah, blah, to, uh, to, to acclimate, assimilate, find, find some symbiosis. Ever thought, about, ever thought about being a podcast host? <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd be good at it. Um, I, I, really enjoy, I really enjoy that shape shifting. Yeah. You know? I, I really enjoy learning, um, learning a new culture, um, understanding what hospitality means in different countries to different people, to different groups, um, and then adapting how I present both myself respectfully with empathy um, and ha- personally and then professionally if I'm there for work how am I gonna how am I gonna galvanize this community of this bar community in whichever city country neighborhood whatever behind what it is I want them to support got of it. mine got it so so back to these owners of mm. lab right I asked you what it was like what I was trying to get at is like what was it about the culture that they created that made everybody come up to work to have fun, even more fun than the guests. This there there was no award culture associated with it. Go back to that point of the conversation. Good, good provocation. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with trust. So, as the general manager, I was trusted to run the business in the best way I believed that I could. In addition, I then trusted my bar team to do what they needed to do in the best way they could. So my job as general manager at Lab was, if we're top down, was to take the trust that I'd been given. um, And I went to work on behalf of my bar team, not the other way around. So my job as general manager at Lab was to make my team's job easy and fun servant leadership yeah so from both directions from the ownership down to management you offer some context as to what that trust looked like how you receive that <laughs> trust uh it's earned um i earned it really quickly because the first week i took the cash to the bank the investor a guy called philip goosens um Fuck cranberry. Um, <laughs> pulled me to one side and said there must be something wrong. Like we've never banked this much cash in labs history. I'm like, okay. Like, and what? I, we took money. I put it in the safe every night. And then on Monday morning, I took it to the bank. Full stop. And they're like, yeah, but not... We've never had this much. So my, my trust was earned in that moment. I don't need to elaborate on that. Anyone, no. anyone who's been We're reading between the lines. That, right. Um, and from that moment on, I, I was trusted to deli- to deliver. Right. But it seems like some people couldn't be trusted. Um, and there was still that level of the operation was still going. So at this moment, when you proved that you could be trusted because of the data, the facts, um, did they? Did it, do you think they maybe gave you more of a leash to to lead and manage with further I, trust? I I, I I understand the question, but I I don't I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that because all all, all I could do was my best. Yeah, and, so, and I continue to. So along this idea of the trust trickling down, right? So you, you showed how they gave you trust. They handed you a wad of cash, and they say, "We trust you," right? Like you need a lot of trust to do something like that, right? I, I don't think there's any other way you can say I trust you. Than handing somebody thousands of dollars and saying like we trust pounds, pounds. Thank you. Um, so how did you display trust? How did you give trust uh, to my team? Yeah, I, I we'd, we'd have a, a weekly team meeting and I would say, I'm I'm here to work for you. What do you need to make life easy? Sometimes it was like we need to remodel the toilets because they're disgusting and they need. Yeah. Was that refresh- monkey see monkey do? Was that because you were getting the that level of trust being given to you? I was 24 years old, so I wasn't I wasn't coming into this bar management role at Lab 
with management experience under my belt. So I was, I was learning on the job. So, so by trust, I think what I'm trying to say, um, did you feel like the owners of Lab knew that they existed to serve you? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. And there, there was one occasion where, uh, I mean, it's so long ago, I don't mind telling the stories. Um, I actually changed the locks of the bar so that the owners couldn't get in. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter why, but there, there was a moment where I'm like, no, you can't have the keys to your own bar. Because if you want, I, I will gladly, willingly, with love in my heart, have 100% responsibility for something. I will not have 84% responsibility. Because that 16%, I'll, I'll get fucked right. at 16%, right? So if you, want, if you want me to be the key holder and general manager, I'll do it. But I need 100% responsibility or I'll, or I'll accept zero. So I, don't I, I really loved, I loved my bar team and there was some challenges at the time. And I said, okay, well, I, I had a decision to make in that moment. Do I roll with it and just not take responsibility or do I fight to to be extremely proud of what we as a team will and did achieve at lab and I chose the latter I'm like fuck it right I will take 100% responsibility I will change the locks I will be the only key holder I will be here at 2 p.m. six days a week to open the bar I will lift up support and champion my team um, and that sounds possessive. Like we were, we were one team. They're not my team. Like we, we, from 2000 to 2005, were the lab team that people today look back on and uh, ap appreciate with a degree of nostalgia. Those years, um, and lab lab went on to to, you know, it was open for 15, 14, 15 years in the end. That's a great run for any high end cocktail bar in a major city. Um, and that's not to be sniffed at, but 2000, 2005, there is obviously I'm biased and there is a degree of, of, right. of big hearted, you know, love and nostalgia for, for that time period. But give me hundred percent responsibility or give me none. So is this when you became the licensee? Like what, you have I this was, title of licensee. No, I didn't okay. know. I was never the licensee. Okay. So, um, the licensee, uh, changed hands a couple of times during my tenure. I never, I never put my name above the door. Okay. Um, not because I didn't want to. Um, it was already somebody else's, and I, okay. it, it wasn't something that I needed as a badge of honor. So five year run. Yep. Amazing restaurant, or I should say bar. Um, that served food. Yeah. Known for the <laughs> bar. Um, why leave? Um. Great question. I'm gonna pull myself some more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you want a little bit more? I'm sure I shouldn't be doing this in this bar, but here we are. Uh, actually, do you want to pause right here, and do you want me to go order another drink for you? No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I, I like. I prefer the flow. If that makes sense. Do you guys have enough room? We're at like a break. Do you guys need? Right. Do, you, do you like to pull this place in? Okay. Just making sure. <laughs> um. So five year run. Um, why leave? I've never been one to rest on my laurels, ever. Um, I, my work ethic, um, whether that came from my mother or my father or both, or you know, whatever, genetics. Um, my work ethic was always to fight for the next thing. I loved my time at lab, but the last two years I wasn't challenged. I was the key holder. You know, I, we'd implemented systems and processes. The team was stable. There was no, there was no staff churn. Um, you know, everyone. You know, we, we were set. Yeah, your you sense know, the growth sounded like it was being like held back. I, I I I wasn't learning anything new, and I wasn't being challenged. And when I got behind the bar, the bartender's like, "Can you get the fuck out? You're in the way." Um, and I don't blame them. <laughs> yeah. But I wanted to get behind the bar because I was bored. Honestly, I wasn't being challenged. I wasn't learning anything. Um, you know, and, and Nelson Mandela's quote was ringing in my ears. I never lose, I either win or learn. And I wasn't learning. Right. I wasn't winning. I was just, I was in stasis, right. career, career stasis. And that's okay. Like, that's fine. Some people are really, really happy with, with that stability. I'm not. Right. Um, 25 years old. No, now I'm 20, 
28. 28 years 7, 28. Yeah. Okay. So what, what were you – what was like? What was inside of you? What, what was your gut telling you you had to do at this point? All right. So the style of cocktails at Lab, we, we were – successful whatever however you wish to define success yeah and um this flies really pissed me off uh <laughs> we were we were recognized as, as a successful global cocktail bar yeah cool i was bored guests started to ask if lab did external events oh can you come in can we get these cocktails in our office for our 10th anniversary we're getting married in Norfolk in three months. Can you do, can you guys, like, do you have an external? And we're like, no, no, no. I went to the owners of Lab and said, can I, can we set up Lab events, LTD? And like, nah, zero interest. Ugh, I'm none. A, I'm like, my blood's boiling right now just listening to this. Like, it's such I, a lost opportunity. I got so much money in that. shut down so hard. You can charge so much more. So. I walked from lab on all on the all margins are already good. Wait, wait, wait. I got, I, I, hey, there's more to it. So I, <laughs> I remember asking Doug, like Doug, I keep getting asked if we do events. Can we just do events? He's, he's like, no, I have no interest in it. I'm like, fuck. So I went to Leicester Square Tube Station, subway station. It's about 300 meters from the front door of lab. Uh, at Leicester Square, London. I went down into the subway station, to the tube station, and they had a vending machine that made business cards. So I put like two pounds 40 in the machine, printed 50 business cards. I didn't have a, a company name in mind, and I'm stood, it's such a visceral <laughs> memory, core memory. I'm stood in front of this business, cards, business card vending machine, trying to come up with a company name so that I could give those cards to guests that came into lab asking for lab events. So I'm like, what do we, what do, we do? Like, I mean, I can do anything. Like, I'm like, I don't mean that I'm not being uh, arrogant. I mean, like, if, if somebody picked up the phone to me and said, can you organize this bar for us? My answer is yes, of course we can. I'll figure it out after. So I'm like, okay, we do everything to do with bars. Like with bar, like fucking, like what? Well, uh, I'm in the tube station. Hustle and bustle yeah. of, you know, W, you know, West End London, <laughs> around behind me. I'm like, fuck, uh, the bar, the bar, we did bar everything, bar, bar total, bar total. So bar total became my um, side hustle in the last couple of years that I was general manager of Lab. Tell me you killed it, yo, dude. Pernery Card UK was one of our biggest clients in the end, um, and so for the last two and a bit years of my time at Lab, I was general manager of Lab and I had this side hustle, Bar Total. And we were doing, we, in the end, I've, I, my business partner who's a bartender at Lab, Ed McAvoy, love him. I almost like forced him to quit Lab to go like full time because right. I like- I wouldn't be surprised we if you're so matching busy. your salary, if not ex exceeding your salary. Again, uh, it's so long ago. I don't mind talking about it, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, in the time it was a, it was a at the time. Well, it you was did the right thing. You went to the owner and you said, "There's opportunity here. Like, can we do something about this? Can I cut you in on this?" And they said, "No, we're not interested." You're like, "Okay, I am." <laughs> Period. Yeah, I don't. I have nothing to add. Yeah, so that's exactly what happened. You did. Yeah, so I mean, good on you for seeing that opportunity and capitalizing on it. I. I so well, that led to everything I've got in my life. I've got over a bar. That, that, for the record, to this day is still a huge opportunity that people don't see. Uh, mobile bartending, it's harder. It's, it can be difficult to get the licensing, and liability is an issue with when going on site to places, like really having good insurance. Or well, I would love to solve that problem yeah, for anybody yeah. listening who is looking for those solutions in uh, North America because I have solved that problem in North America. Should we wait until um, we get to that point? Talk, sure. Is that what you're doing today? Sure. Okay. So um, I set up Bar Total. Um, we did Puerto Rico UK became an exclusive client of ours. We launched Havana Club and, and Yahoo Especial in the UK. We did countless events across UK, Ireland, Europe. We did the Irish Film and Television Awards. We did the BAFTAs in London. We did for Red Bull. We did so many incredible events. We did Cannes Film Festival and you know the Duty Free Show in Cannes and, and like it just incredible shit all across UK and Europe whilst being general manager at Lab. 
So the transition from lab and my exit from lab was a combination of, of um, I, I really don't like using the word luck because it's not luck. Um, well, it, the harder we work, the better we are, the more good we do, the more lucky we seem to be. Yeah, but luck for me, luck for me suggests chance. You know, like, oh, I'm just lucky to be in the right place at the right time. No, no. You're in that place because of decisions that have been made right. and work that you've done. And you should be, I, 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 should, I'm, I won't speak for anybody but myself. Um, I felt so fortunate to be able to be a kind of yes man in, in a lot of ways. Um, John, would you like this opportunity? Yes, I would. John, can you, and you've got an event company, right? I'm like, yep. Uh, can you do this event? Yep. What's the event? Like, we'd say yes and then figure it out. Yeah, the answer is yes. What's the question? Get fine. Period. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Got to quote Cameron Mitchell on that one. I can't take, I can't, <laughs> I can't take credit. Uh, I love it because that's exactly right. Um, so I printed out my business cards, uh, started my two-year side hustle uh, in my kind of two-year... It took two years to quit lab um, because I loved it. I loved it. I loved my team. I loved the job. I loved the bar. I loved what we were doing. I loved the recognition before there was a recognition platform or platforms. Um, and eventually... Oh, I've missed... I missed a bit at university it doesn't matter eventually I um, a Brazilian guy this, this is the start of a really good joke a Brazilian guy walks into a bar <laughs> it's not because it's true uh, his name is Marcos de Moraes he'd been sent to me by um, a guy called Nick Gillett I definitely know that name is he in Washington now no 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 he's, he's a giraffe or something like that uh -uh. no I'm thinking somebody else yeah. Marco. okay he, he's an extremely wealthy and successful okay. beautiful human um, from Brazil um, Never mind. <laughs> and he was launching a cachaça called Saga Tiba, Saga Chiba. And he was sent to me as a, somebody that could do the launch events for Saga Tiba in the UK as they were um, just pushing into the UK as their third market. So they were in Brazil, they were in Paraguay, and now they would come to the UK to launch in the UK. Mar Marcos walks into lab. Hi, are you, are you John? I've been sent by Nick to, you know, see if you can work on the launch of my cachaça. I'm like, yes. What's the question? Yeah. Um, and we ended up doing two launch events back to back, uh, two nights. We made three and a half thousand wow. caipirinhas per night. So we did 7,000 caipirinhas over two nights launching this cachaça. At day three, when we're cleaning up and like bumping out of the event space, Marcos comes to me and goes, what, what are you? You've just made 7,000 perfect Caipirinhas. Can you, can your agency, Bar Total, represent Sagatiba in the UK? I'm like, uh, let me do a little bit of research and I'll get back to you. So I went away. Um, so is your agency the event company at this point? Yeah, Bar Total. Got it. Yeah. Um, so we'd moved from event company to consultancy. <laughs> What up, Unstoppable Restaurant Owners and Operators? We have to interrupt today's video to let you know that Restaurant Unstoppable and Restaurant Systems Pro, we're taking our relationship to the next level. Beginning in July of 2024, Fred Langley, CEO of Restaurant Systems Pro, is making himself available once a week in Restaurant Unstoppable Network to answer all of your restaurant systems questions, whether it's the profit margins. He will look at your P&L. Bring your P&L. He will take a look at that. He will dissect it. He will help you find your profit, whether that be through budgeting, inventory management, costing recipe cards, uh, labor, checklists, you name it. He is a master of restaurant systems and he's making himself available to you. Fred Langley and Restaurant Systems Pro started as a consulting firm and for over 16 years, they've been helping their clients increase their profit by 10% or more. What are you waiting for? Click the link below to join our Facebook group, Restaurant Unstoppable Network. So yeah, Mar Marcos wanted to hire Bar Total as, as its UK ambassador. So hiring an agency to be its UK ambassador. I then went online and did some research into, um, did some research, just say half an hour, did some research into who Marcos is, was, and, um, he was a very successful Brazilian entrepreneur. 
and <laughs> a very successful Brazilian entrepreneur. And he, I, I then said, I, Marcos, if you hire me full time, I'll quit my job at Lab and I will sell my half of my event company and I'll come work for you full time. He's like, okay, done. And that was that. And I went to work for Sagativa. That took me to 75 countries around the world and elevated my career in ways that were just phenomenal. And I, I built this incredible network of, of beautiful friends and bartenders around the world. Got it. Okay. We're an hour into this conversation, man. You've given us amazing detail, amazing life lessons. I feel like this is the point of the conversation where your life kind of takes a shift towards consulting, traveling, growing brands. We get 20 years ahead of us. Where do we, where do we like fast forward and slow us down? Or like, so, where does it make sense to slow down? I guess. The second team is pretty straightforward. That, that was about saying that was about being an honest, hardworking global social chameleon. Um, I, I was given so much trust again um, at Sagatiba to to represent it in the best possible way I could in countries and markets where cachaça was unknown. So it, it was a strategic choice to say yes to to Sagatiba as a cachaça. There was nobody in the world working in the cachaça space, which meant I had free air. Um, there were vodka ambassadors, there were gin ambassadors, there were whiskey ambassadors. There was no one in Cachaca. And that's a rum, basically, right? A Brazilian oh. rum? No? I had to look it up because I never heard of it before. Oh, just and they said, it's, 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 they said it's a Brazilian rum. So in my defense, that's not my answer. That's well, the internet's answer. Okay. Because <laughs> I wasn't the familiar. Internet, what is okay, it? Okay, okay. So it's, it's made from cane sugar? Oh, my God. Okay. I'll, no? We'll do, we'll do the, we'll do the 411. I'm being there. Uh, no, not at all. It is made from um, sugar cane. Uh, cachaça is made from freshly squeezed sugar cane juice. Rum is made from molasses, which is the byproduct of sugar production. Got it. So when you make sugar, there is a waste product that goes on to become rum. Got it. Cachaça is exclusively freshly squeezed sugar cane juice that is then fermented and distilled. More pure. Not rum. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, that. no. I mean, I like it, I, it's, it, it's like half a career's worth of. Work. I'm from New Hampshire, man. I'm like the least like cultured person out there. It's uh, a bunch of white people in their little bubble. We do we do our best. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing my best. Um, no, it, it, Brazilian rum is not inaccurate because that's how the U.S. Uh, classified cachaça. Um, Products like champagne and cognac have what's called Appalachian of Origin Controlly. They can only be called those things if they come from those particular geographies. Cachaça was not recognized by the US as cachaça. It was recognized as Brazilian rum and lumped into rum as a category for the USA. And that was really um, inaccurate. Um, and it's taken Brazil a long time to reclassify as cachaça, which they have done now. So cachaça is cachaça is cachaça. Thank you for making Period. an example of me publicly. The world is better after this moment. Restaurant unstoppable, my <laughs> ass. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm kidding, never, I'm kidding. I'm I never kidding. claimed to be the expert. I, I, that's why I go to people who are smarter than I am. I, I love it. Thank you for the opportunity to clarify all of that. Of course. Uh, I, I feel like a better man now. So... And if the, the mission is to inspire, empower, and ch change the world through inspiring power in the industry, and the way that we do that is by focusing on the evolution, the, the transformation of individuals and their journey in the industry, where do we go to? Take us to where we need to go on your timeline. The year now is 20... So now... 2005. Now, yeah, 2000, exactly. 2005, I left lab. 2011, I moved to Sydney, Australia. So my six years ish with Sagatiba took me around the world many, so many times. So they recruit years. you. You're now selling. I, I'm now a global brand ambassador. I'm I'm at Tales of the Cocktail. I'm at, you know, um, BCB in Berlin. I'm I'm at Sydney Bar Show. I'm at, you know, Shanghai. Whatever. I'm at, like, it was it was incre you incredible. You do that for five years, right? Yeah. So 2011. Yeah. And towards the end of that, I, it was the most incredible job. And on paper. I still, you know, the my dear friends that are, that knew me back then, and, and we're still really close. We we look back and kind of chuckle to ourselves because on paper it looks like the most glamorous 
lifestyle, it was really, really lonely. I was having this incredible career opportunity around the world, meeting the most incredible bartenders, managers, owners, who are still friends of mine today in, in most cases, um, or in a lot of cases rather. But I was lonely. I was flying by myself. I was in a hotel room by myself. I, was, I had to be self-motivated, self-managed, and I got lonely, is the honest, honest, I don't think I've ever said that in the public domain. Um, I got lonely. And the last 18 months, maybe two years of my six years with Sagatiba, it felt really solitary. And I was having the most incredible day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year. It was, it was fun. I, I mean, I can relate. No words. I travel the country in a camper, dude. Like, I totally get it. And like you, to your point, you meet these incredible people. Every day you're being lifted by these people who are just badasses. Yep. And you high five, bro and, hug, and, and bounce. But I, it's like, is a memory a memory unless it's shared? Like, and like, it's hard to say, like, when you have all these great experiences and you have nobody that you can turn to and say, remember that? Oh, yeah. Or, or, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, like I, wanted, like I wanted. I have nobody wanted, to share this with. I wanted somebody next to me to to spoil and you know, I, relationship is the wrong word. I, I just I had nobody to share this incredible. I call it an anchor. Exper- Thank you. That's a lovely term. It's like um, you you have these great relationships. You're not right. alone, but there's there's not that one consistent relationship in your life that just knows exactly where you're at. Correct. And correct. That's lovely. I'm gonna because I'm, that's what I have now. Um, yeah. So now, now I'm kind of skipping a little bit, but now I have this kind of hub and spoke lifestyle. I have a hub. I have a place I call home that I come back to between every trip, between every everything. It's where I'm going to go after we, fin- after we wrap here. And then from my hub, my home, my anchor, I then branch out. But with Sagatiba, I would just roll around the world. I, I lived in... I, I traveled for 48 weeks out of 52. Yeah. I was technically homeless in the UK. I could have claimed like job seekers allowance in the UK because I was of no fixed abode and I didn't have a job that was registered in the UK to a company. I could have, I didn't, claimed the doll uh, right. as it's known in the UK. And it was, it, it was, yeah, I really, it was another node in my career in my career and my life choices and and at that point i was challenged to make my next choice i'm like i'm really lonely i need i need an anchor it's a beautiful term thank you i'm taking that on tour take it man um i needed an anchor i didn't have one i had no reason to go anywhere particularly so the transition from sagatiba to my next job which was think spirits in australia was developed over the years I was at Sagatiba. I went to Australia twice a year. Think Spirits was the importer and distributor of Sagatiba in Australia. So I worked with Think Spirits twice a year for five years um, of my six. And the owner of Think Spirits, Patrick Borg, who I referenced earlier today for giving me the feedback as a gift one-liner. I don't know where he got it from, but I credit him with it. Um, He, over the years, said, listen, Sagatiba is, is being built to be sold I'm like, of course we all know that it's a you know there's an exit strategy and somebody you know one of the big guys is gonna buy it campari bought it in 2010 ish um we were all made redundant and patrick promised that when that happened when sagatiba was bought by a major campari in this case he was going to do two things immediately that that story went public First, he was going to put a call into another Kachasa to replace Sagatib in his portfolio. Second, he was going to call me and we're, I'm going to fly to Sydney and work with Patrick at Think Spirits. He was true to his word on both of those. He called, he fixed up another Kachasa before calling me, um, then called me and I said, I, I can't. I need, I'm, I'm, I really, today we'd, we'd call it burnt out, you know, I needed a mental health break. You know, we're, we're much more comfortable with that sort of vocabulary these days. Back then, I'm like, I don't know what I am. I just know I can't jump straight into the next thing. Right. So I moved to Bali for a year and Good for you. chilled in a beautiful, I was by myself, chilled in a beautiful little house with a pool with a maid that came and cleaned every day. And, you know, it, it was exactly what I needed. That is not on your LinkedIn. Eh? No, it's not on my LinkedIn. <laughs> so is that, Again, 2000, I'm not is that 10 to 2011? Uh, is that 2011, 10, 10, 2012? 10 and a half to 11 and a half. Okay. Got it. So you were Think Marketing, or sorry, Think, think Spirits, Spirits uh, as a trade marketing manager. Um it sounds like 
and correct me if I'm wrong, from like this point to where you are today, a lot of the work that you're doing is similar along this same vein of going into places, educating people, uh, elevating their, their program. But now you're doing that on a little bit more of a holistic approach. So what I, I, I learned so much at Think Spirits, courtesy of Patrick. Like he, he taught me what it is to build brands. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to answer your question in a roundabout kind of way, as I have every question you've asked me. Um, in our industry, as a bartender, we, have, we are surrounded by glass bottles with a liquid inside. Those glass bottles can't talk. They can't tell a story. They have no personality. They're inanimate. I'm staring at 400 agave it's products. It's a label. Back. That's all no, but, it is. It's yeah, but it can't speak. Right. It doesn't have a voice. It can't tell the story. So my job in trade marketing was to infuse a human persona and personality into this glass, inanimate glass bottle with a liquid inside it. If I was able to translate that story to a bartender in such a way that they... I call it indelible. So it was an indelible experience. Evoke to emotion. Meeting, and we use Sagatiba as the example, right? Sagatiba is a glass bottle of cane spirit from Brazil. whoop de doo When, as a brand ambassador, I've been asked this so many times, what, does, what did success look like for you? How did you know you were successful? Successful is subjective. Yeah, it's relative. <laughs> Patrick? taught me another question to ask. It was like, oh yeah, we're doing we're doing really, really well in Arizona. I'm like, cool, what does really well mean? Oh, we've sold like six cases. I'm like, okay. <laughs> is that not I, I love that for you. Like, <laughs> yeah. it, but it, what, so su- success is the why, it, it's subjective and it has, it's stretchy. Success for me, if I'd done a great job as a global brand ambassador for Sagatiba, success was an expression that took less than one second to be conveyed. What do I mean? A bartender would pick up a bottle of Sagatiba, hold the bottle by the neck, the corner of either the left or right bit of their mouth would would cur- curl into a wry smile because of some stupid joke I told in a masterclass training session, whatever, or <laughs> John was in here last night. You know, th- that millisecond of positive emotive response I got to an inanimate glass bottle with a liquid yeah. inside it, was my success. Yeah. That was all I needed to sleep really well that night. Well, that and five Caipirinhas. Uh, <laughs> um, so that was, that's how I deemed success. So when I moved to Australia, I knew that I needed to quickly go from unknown to known, so be memorable. Um, I needed to infuse the brands in our Think Spirits portfolio with a human persona and personality and I would be that human persona and personality I would I would embody the whichever brand I was representing whenever I traveled around Australia chameleon but I had a Trojan horse so Fernet Branca was in our portfolio so Fernet is you 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 don't like Fernet you love it you love it or you hate it yeah love and hate are both sides of the same coin or, or two sides of the same coin there's no middle ground. We're like, no, you know, I can, I can, if it's in front of me, I'll drink. No, you love it with everything that love means or you hate it with the vehemence that hate carries with it. Those two emotions are very, very similar. And whether you loved it or hated it, you'd remember me, John, because I gave you your first shot of Fernet in Australia, in Adelaide or Perth or fucking Melbourne, wherever. And so I used Fernet Branca as my Trojan horse around Australia to become known really quickly, memorable really quickly, good or bad, I didn't care. You'd remember, that was the important bit. And then um, behind my Fernet Branca show would come all the other brands of my portfolio. Once I made a connection, a a human connection with a decision maker, bartender, whomever, they would then be open to receiving the rest of what I had to say. This is the secret to business. Business is literally company okay company what is company out of business context i'm having company what is that it's people it's relationships human 
business. We're, we're not in a glass bottle and liquid business. We're in a human business. Yes, and that is universally true. And I don't think we realize that sometimes. We are in the business of serving others and making people happy. And it's literally all about relationships. And if you can get them to trust you and if you, if you establish that relation, if you get them to like get over that hump, and that to me was like the curl in, their, in the, the cheek that you saw. You're like, this guy likes me. This person likes me. It's like that's the hard I part. I cannot tell you how much that made me happy. I didn't. I didn't need to be told it. It's a I didn't need it a text message. I didn't need. It. I just needed, dude. Just that. There's something there. Imperceptible, in a, positive emotive so response. So I probably quote Maslow's hierarchy of needs way too often. But when you look at what we need, right above physiological needs, being seen, being valued is the next important thing. You don't think that the people that are attracted to this industry don't fucking love and like just fucking like nurse off of the idea of like you see me, you like me? Like like when we like we like that is the cookie at the end of the day. Like you see me, you like me, you approve of the what's happening right now, you're going to come back. Like there's a something that we like we are like there's a relationship here. If you, a connection has been made. That is like yep. the, that is something special. Yes, yes, yes. But I, I think it takes it. I think it takes a very special human to be able to realize how they are perceived. If that makes sense. So I, I have. I've been a bar manager. Um, I've had sales reps and brand ambassadors approach me countless times with countless products. And I, I now approach those same folks with that history in mind. I.e., if it's busy, I'm just going to have a cocktail and shake hands. If it's quiet, I'm going to ask, is this a good time? Or I'm going to ask a team member who makes the decisions about the products you carry. Can I have their contact details? And then I bounce and I reach out. It's slow, but it's honest. It's authentic. It's empathetic. I'm. I'm. I know what it is to be approached by brand folk, be they sales reps for a distributor or, you know, uh, uh, paid paid for by their brands. I know what it's like to be approached by those folks. So I work extremely hard and very patiently to not be annoying <laughs> dude there's a lot of parallels between being a, an alcohol sales representative and a podcast host like the whole reason i live on the road in this lifestyle is because i for me it's about the slow burn it's not about wham bam get in get out it's not about like it's like it's networking it's all about the relationships how did i find you word of mouth ross simon you Fuck know that guy <laughs> But, you know, like, it, there, there's something about, I think we live in a world where everyone is being told that the the, the secret is do as many interviews as possible, uh, you know, like, connect with as many people as you can digitally. But that is the same thing as being on a processed food diet. It's, it's you know what I'm saying? It's it's not, su there's no substance there. But when you take the time to slow down and to focus on a relationship and to establish a relationship and tap into a vein of, a root system of people and relationships and just be present and like if you take care of one person I'm sure this, I'm talking about your career right now right. if you take care of one person you don't think they're friends with the the, 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 the bar manager down the street like how many times I, I'm, one I'm a huge I'm a huge made? proponent of kill with kindness you know like I right. I don't have the the luxury to be an asshole right <laughs> or the bank account <laughs> I mean, I do want to respect the space we're in, um, and I and I we're at about an hour and twenty six minutes of recording right now. These podcasts are about two hours long. I want to make sure that the next conversation we have is leading into what you're doing today, Love that. and how you lift people up today. So I don't want to jump over anything important. No, no. Um, thank you. Well, I mean, I I can skip through. So Australia, fundamental. I then work for a global event company called Sweet and Chili. Um, joined the Sweet and Chili USA team in LA. Um, that was my ticket back to, to Los Angeles and the United States, which I love. And I built now a wonderful little universe, little bubble around 
all the things that make me happy every day. I, I don't I don't have a job. I have a lifestyle that I'm I feel so fortunate that I'm able to afford the things I want to afford. And that doesn't mean I'm rich. It means it's it a nice Airbnb you driving around, man. It's a nice that's that's nice. It is. Like, you know, like you know, like you've earned that. I, yeah, but I'm not. I'm, yes, but I, I, I also work extremely hard not to be a douchebag about it. So, sorry. Um, I hope you didn't take it that. No, way. no. But I'm, I'm. I mean, it's LA, so I'm very conscious of how, of how, uh, <laughs> I hear you. Of, of how things can sound. Yeah. So I'm. I, I talk constantly about retiring. I'm never going to retire. I'm always going to be working. Retirement for me has a very specific. It will be a very specific moment. That moment will be when I never need to talk about money. It's not about having tons of it. It's about never speaking, negotiating, dealing, thinking, worrying stri- about money. Money is a fucking cancer. I hate it. We need it because it makes the world go round, whatever. Retirement for me will be the day where I never need to speak of money again. And I, I, have, I need to achieve that within eight years. That's, my, that's the line in the sand that I've set for myself. I don't... I don't know whether what I'm saying sounds good or reads well on paper. I really don't. I don't. I don't mind. You know. You need security. Welcome, anyone's welcome to give me a shout to reclarify or what does that mean? I'm always going to be working. I. But you want to be able to get to a point where the decisions you are making aren't based off of income. It's based off of what you want to do. I. 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 Eighty percent of my life's expenditure is around experiences, not things. I, I collect experiences, nights out, travel, scuba diving is my passion outside of bars and booze. Do you ever go uh, foraging? I have. I recently got invited to do like a, I think it's like, what do they call it? Like a tree, tree therapy or something? Oh, I don't you know. You go hug a tree. I, I've oh, been really? foraging for like gin botanicals in Kenya and, you know. I, I'm been terrified foraging. of the ocean. The only reason why oh I could God, get I into, it. I'm scared of sharks, bro. I love sharks. I mean, I'm gonna ooh. show you a video when we're done of me on a shark dive in Australia. Yeah, I mean, my feet aren't webs, my hands aren't webs. I don't belong in the ocean, but I do think the idea of foraging, like going into the ocean and getting like amazing seafood, oh, is super, 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 super appealing. Like, if I were to ever overcome my fear of being eaten by a great white shark, it would be because what a way to go. Oh yeah, but ugh. anyway, <laughs> I digress. What are you? Tell me what you're doing today. What is your business model today? So, Coruscant Co. today is a huge sense of pride, accomplishment, determination, hard work. Um, Emily, Emily and I have known each other for more than 24 years. Um, so we have, Coruscant Co., between Emily and I, we have more than 50 years of collective experience. This year is our, our third year in business in the U.S., we have an Australian entity, a US entity, and a UK entity. I'm Coruscant Co. is a one-stop shop for all things global drinks and hospitality. How what many do people I, are part of your team? Is Emily and I. Okay. Well, th- actually, this year this is the first time. Ah, this is an exclusive. Yeah. Um, we are adding um, a chief operations officer this year. Um, his name is Wayne Apple. One of my besties, absolute legend, um, wicked smart, based in Grand Cayman, but moving to Florida um, to begin working with us and grow our, our company together. So Emily and I have known each other for a combined more than 50 years. We have more than 50 years of, of global drinks and hospitality experience. Emily's on the corporate side. She's been with Diageo for 18 plus years. Past sponsor of the show. It's going to throw oh, no, out there. there yeah, yeah. Thank you, Diageo. Word. Love them. Um, I still do a lot of work with Diageo. Throw we, we I'm do. looking for 2025 sponsors. But throw my hat, my name in the hat. <laughs> love, love that for you. Uh, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> um, you're the one feeding me alcohol. I'm I, a loose. You're welcome. Um, it's delicious. So we, Emily and I, have been dancing around the idea of working together for years, and then the pa- the pandemic hit, and we're like, you know what? Let's just fucking do it. And then, so then it was about like, why? What's the why? Why are we doing this? Why should anyone care? Who gives a fuck? Um, and the why was like, it doesn't matter. We don't need to answer that for everybody else. Like, yeah. why are you and I going into business together? Why are we doing it? And the answer was, we want to work with people that we want to work with. Mm. 
We want to do the things that we enjoy. We want to have fun doing it, get paid properly, and do great work and have fun yeah. doing it. You know what I'm thinking of? I've been thinking about this for a little bit now. The four pillar, the, the four pillars of freedom. Do you know what they are by any chance? I'm guess. excited to learn. Freedom of money. Freedom of time. Yep. Freedom of relationships. Freedom of purpose. Beautiful. And, and I've definitely heard the freedom of time or the freedom of uh, money come out saying like you you don't want to make another decision that's based off of money. Yeah. Now I'm hearing that your your freedom of time or relationships is really important to you. Very. Where like you want to put that ahead of freedom of money and you want to be able to choose who you want to work with. Freedom of purpose, why? Why are we doing this? Are we working for ourselves or someone else? Are we, are we working towards our dream of freedom of relationships or are we working for someone else's dream? And then freedom of, of um, what did I say? Time. I think that's everyone. Time, that, purpose, That's just being able to do what you got. Yeah. Like you, you got the freedom of time. You got the freedom of money. You, you're working on that in your retirement. Mm-hmm. You got the freedom of purpose and relationships, man. Like, Thank those, you. I've, n- I've never had it articulated in that way, but that's awesome. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, um, I that yeah full stop so in in creating a company Carlos and Co now that I've heard that articulated in the way that you just have I'm like that's exactly we didn't use those that vernacular but that's exactly why we started working together that's why we still work together and those four pillars of, of what's the right word it's not success it's gross freedom um, no, this because that's I, one of the pillars. Um, oh no, freedom! Free, yeah, okay, it's the freedom. <laughs> yeah, um, the ability to. I, th- I think the thing that excites me the most and makes me happiest is being able to work with people that I want to work with. I don't have to work with anyone, which makes me very happy. Yeah, I like mean, it makes me. I sleep so well at night. Yeah. What did we say earlier? Freedom is about, or business is about relationships. And when you get to choose the relationships you show up to every day. You don't think that makes the job a better day? Like, 100%. And that's why they say hire slow, fire fast. So I have a, I, I have a measure twice, cut once. Yeah. Same, 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 but different. I, um, so I want to make sure we get to what's making me happy today and why, what, you know, what today's yeah, yeah. Get into it. purpose is. Uh, not today this, but today in general. Um, we have a handful of clients. We are a full service, 360 degree agency. We now, as of this week, also own a slice of an on-premise venue in Los Angeles. What up, Unstoppable restaurant owners and operators? We have to interrupt today's video to let you know that Restaurant Unstoppable and Restaurant Systems Pro, we're taking our relationship to the next level. Beginning in July of 2024, Fred Langley, CEO of Restaurant Systems Pro, is making himself available once a week in Restaurant Unstoppable Network to answer all of your restaurant systems questions, whether it's the profit margins. He will look at your P&L, bring your P&L, he will take a look at that, he will dissect it, he will help you find your profit, whether that be through budgeting, inventory management, costing recipe cards, uh, labor, checklists, you name it, he is a master of restaurant systems and he's making himself available to you. Fred Langley and Restaurant Systems Pro started as a consulting firm and for over 16 years they've been helping their clients increase their profit by 10% or more. What are you waiting for? Click the link below to join our Facebook group, Restaurant Unstoppable Network. We are a third party provider. We are the conductor of an orchestra. We, the reason I use the conductor analogy is because I don't know everything, nor should I, nor could I. A conductor of an orchestra cannot play all 70 instruments in that orchestra. The conductor's job is to know who the best ones are for each instrument in their orchestra. Yes. And then to bring them together and help them all make beautiful music. This sounds like a restaurant tour's job. <laughs> that's, like, that's what we yeah. do at Carson Co. Yeah. We, are the, we are the conductor. This is the best at this. This is the best at that. Here is the brief for the you 3PL partners. Yo, I got to tie this and together. And that's what I do. I'm having a moment right now. I love this Just feeling. recently had um, Regan Jasper on the show. Okay. You know the name Regan Jasper? Have you ever heard of Fox Restaurant Group? Mm. Yeah. 
Regan Actually. was Sam Fox's right hand man. No shit. Okay. Regan was the first person that had equity in the Fox concepts. Regan, I've never talked to Sam Fox, and if you're listening to this, Sam Fox, doubt it. I would, I would, I would probably argue that the the reason for Fox and their success is because of Regan Jasper, the person who's responsible, the conductor for, of the orchestra, the people picker is what he calls it. it and like that's really what will make or break. It's 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 having this ability to see talent in others, recognize yes. strengths, and put people in the right seat on your bus. If somebody's shit at something, stop giving them that task. Yeah, I, I've got so many examples of like a TJ Friday's aces and places. You, you're you're the head bartender because you're the fastest. You can manage people, blah blah blah. Yeah, and you're the best at it. Go. So. But you're shit at Excel spreadsheets, so don't worry about the cash up. David's going to do the cash Stay up. Stay in your lane. Yeah. But also be self aware enough to know what your lane is. And if right. you're good at something, say it out loud and do more of it. Right. If you're terrible at something, say it out loud and either learn how to be better. Excel spreadsheets were my were my nemesis. I, I'm not a spreadsheet Neither person. However, I had to be in my job in Australia. And so Patrick really helped me out with that. And I now I turn, I love spreadsheets now because I've turned it into a game. Here's a tool that I can have fun with that makes me better at the bits well, of my job. Anytime you get numbers, it gamifies it. You get to see the fruits of your labor I in the form of now, numbers. But yeah. when I was 24, they right. were the bane of my existence and I would have I told thrown you your laptop I'm right out of there the with you, door. man. Uh, numbers can be powerful because it gamifies the work you're doing and, it be, and you, you can create a game against yourself. Correct. Which is very powerful. I love it. Yeah. Now I love it. But it, it, was, a, it was a journey. Yeah, for sure. So um, back to where you are today and what you're doing is like this idea. And I think this is the key. Really, the most successful restaurateurs, they're not the, me- they're not the most talented chefs. They're not the, the, the person that's even the most talented front of house person. They are the person who's the best at seeing... How everyone else is, who was better at them than everything else, and then building layers between you and the work, and then creating systems. Yep. To 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 create opportunity for other people. To lift people up. To lift people up. You are in the business of developing people, not experiences. You're de- you're in, you are developing you are developing people to create those experiences. Yeah. And it, you need. Um like there's so the, whatever the, you're working for, the sorry. End, yeah, yeah the end game is creating experiences right or like we're in the experience economy or you could say we're, we're exiting oh, wow. the experience economy into the transformation economy which is a bunch of experiences over time that helps make somebody better mm-hmm. is what i think is what i call that i like it um but anyway i digress uh i just think what the point i'm trying to make is that like you really you're, you're it's about putting people in the right seat on your bus and it, helping them become a better version of themselves Absolutely, and one of the one of the reasons that Wayne is joining our business this year, um, he I don't think he realized at the time, but he he, had, he made a very profound, off the cuff. We were probably drunk together somewhere, and he said, "Why why do we keep looking to other businesses to to lift us up or sponsor us or pay for shit? Why don't we look within our friendship circle, within our friendship group? Why don't we lift each other up?" Dude. And that really. A franchise. It was like a, it was a, it was like a lightning bolt. I'm like, God damn! Like yeah. I just got off the phone with, you know, a Bacardi Diageo, you know, William Grant type Campari conversation. I'm like, wait, hey, dear friends of mine, who I trust implicitly and who I'd leave alone in my home, do any of you have this thing that I need? I need photography. I need content curation. I need events. I need mobile bars. I need do any of you have uh no but use this person right i've absolutely got that what do you need let me help you and so now that conversation with wayne was maybe four or five years ago um and now he's joining he's joining chorus and co as chief operations officer because we have everything we need in our extremely experienced friendship circle right why why am I, I I don't need to right. I, I, all I need to do is ask my friends right and what you're what you just described is what every restaurant tour can do today within their group of people they've already hired if they hopefully they've built a team around them that they love right and 
maybe that photographer or that designer or that fill in the blank is already on your team, but you hired them to be a server. Correct. Tap the fucking fruit. Like, you know, like, like there's something beyond what the job you hired them for. hundred percent. Yeah. And, and so from the moment that Wayne and I had that chat and he, you know, he articulated that in the way that he did with way more swear words because he's Australian. Um, <laughs> we now are living it. Yeah. That's awesome. And again, it's a, it's a source of extreme pride, um, humility, hard work. There's so much hard work to come, but if I'm, I'm going to be doing it with my besties around me. Yeah. Um, so I've got one more thing, or one more thing that I do that makes me extremely, extremely happy. Um, I'm on the board of directors for Tales of the Cocktail. The Tales of the Cocktail Foundation has been um, a seminal part of my life. This year, in July 2024, as we all head to New Orleans to sweat, um, it'll be my 20th Tales out of 23 years, I think they are now, 22 years old. Um, I've been to all but the very first one. The work that Tails does, my position on the board makes me extremely, extremely happy. So th those are, I just wanted to mention that, not because I need any plaudits for it, but if you are not familiar with Tales of the Cocktail, I urge you as a viewer, listener of this podcast to learn, get yeah. online, Tells of the Cocktail, Google it, read a bit. Um, there is incredible education to be had, an incredible support system and team to help you, help one, navigate through this industry, whatever your challenges or successes or celebrations may be. Um, so I've never been to a Tales of the Cocktail. God damn. Um, when, is it in July? It's in July, and uh, you should come this year, and I'll get you media accreditation so you can bounce around and interview I was people. And say, I got you. <laughs> that wasn't my angle, but I know there's just a wealth of people. In, come, like, come down, come down. I could like, do interviews all day long. Like, I'd love to introduce you to the to the podcast team, Beats Bars and Bourbon. Um, they have become very fast friends, um, and as much as this is, you know. Uh, um, Restaurant Unstoppable, Beats, Bars, and Bourbon is, is a, a podcast crew. Dude, share the love, that, bro. Oh, I'm man, all about I love those we guys We go further so much. together. And we, you know, as you and I have become fast friends today, exactly this situation happened a year ago at Tales. Now they are media partners of the foundation. Nice. Um, you know, as, as we work to increase our diversity and inclusion um, coverage, you know, it's not to say that Tales of Cocktail Foundation is excellent in its inclusiveness and um, in the dictionary definition of that word. Um, the other thing I'd love to shout out is Ajabu. I mentioned it earlier. The Ajabu Cocktail Festival is something that has this year only just come to fruition. It is a bar show, bartender community entity that is showcasing talent on the continent of Africa. So this year it was in Cape Town and Joburg. It'll be back in Cape Town and Joburg next year. The Ajabu, please Google it. Have a look. When is that? Uh, there's one in November, one in March, February, March next year. Can I put year. a camper on a barge it, to <laughs> Africa, <laughs> bro? You don't want to. Yo, I'll fly. I'm I'm not scared of a road trip, but <laughs> Ken, Kenya to Cape Town is uh, Nairobi to Cape Town is hectic. Um, no, I, th there's just really amazing people doing wonderful things in our industry. And if, if I have a platform and a voice to lift them up, as I've just yeah. been discussed, like if I if I don't walk the talk, say what I mean and mean what I say, bringing it back around to the beginning, um, that is who I am as a character, as a professional, as a human. Um, I have some personal projects that mean a lot to me as well. I, I There's a little kid school in, in Kenya, on the coast of Kenya, that my friends and I, Wayne being one of those, yeah. um, you know that we support it's not something i talk about really in the public domain because it's not it's not is there it's a website? only important to no uh my no my facebook group okay. my facebook page. what's the facebook group john Gakur, my my facebook page Got it. it's it's we'll not it's that. not a jared our editor and so much more if you're listening which i hope you are because you're editing this <laughs> you'll be sick of my voice make sure to link to that yeah please okay. that'd be great um, if, yeah, if anybody is interested in doing anything on the continent of Africa, specifically Kenya and or other, I would, I'd love to be that vehicle, you know, to, to 
amplify African voices around the world. It's not me. As much as I was born in Nairobi, I am Kenyan diaspora. I don't, yeah. I don't live and work there every day. So wh what I am able to do is be a, um, a conduit. Yeah, um, a promoter of what's happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So that those, those two things mean a lot to me. Um, Tails means a lot to me. Ajabu means a lot to me. Kenya means a lot to me. I don't know if we distilled exactly what it is you do for you, the people that you choose to work for today. Oh, shit. Or with, I should say. Okay, so we are a full service end-to-end -end entity. What I mean by that is we do not carry an import license. We are not an importer. We are the conductor of the orchestra, right? So if you own a brand anywhere in the world and you have designs and aspirations to be available in the United States of America, Canada, Caribbean, Mexico, Australia, Chorus & Co. can work with you to make that dream a reality. So you help people develop their brand who are trying to break into any market anywhere in we, the world. We don't have to be involved with brand development. Like if you've got a brand, okay, great. If you are trying to figure out what brand to create, that's a very different thing. You have a brand, you're yep. established, yep. and you're trying to break into the market. Correct. You, you are uh, a partner in helping them find the right outlets. Yes, correct. No, no, not the right outlets. We we are a v we've engineered ourselves to be. You only get one chance to make a first impression, right? And the U.S. is an incredibly difficult, complicated, slow, expensive market to enter. Is that because there's only so many companies that carry products, and you have to tap into? No, no, no. It's not that. Like. Um, just brand awareness, loudness. The most ironic collection of words in the English language are United States of America. When it comes to liquor, uh, there is nothing united about them. This is 50... Every state is different. 50 individual countries. Control there states, is not, independent states. There is not even an official language of the United States of America. They are united by the US dollar. Freedom! Only. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Democracy. <laughs> um, so, what? what... As I was working at Sakatiba, working around the world, 75 countries, la 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 la, the, the gap in my experience, knowledge, was the USA. So when I moved here, it was really, really intentional. I moved here strategically to plug a knowledge and experience gap that I knew Just I had. Just make sure my truck was still outside. <laughs> no one's stealing that okay. thing. America. <laughs> GMC. Uh, <laughs> sponsored by. Uh, so I moved here very strategically to, to live here, learn the US liquor landscape, and then help others navigate it. As I'm repeating myself, but you only have one chance to make a first impression. So I'm repeating myself, measure twice, cut once. That is our agency approach. If you have a craft spirit brand somewhere in the world and you have designs and desires on American market entry, come to someone like me, an agency like ours and have a conversation. Why would a restaurant owner reach out to you? Because we're lovely to work with. But why would? How could you help my listeners? Um. So, as well as working with craft spirits, we also work on brick and mortar um, projects. So, when I say we're three hundred and sixty, I mean that we. I have done brick and mortar projects. I've been the beverage program director, we've designed beverage programs, we have written um, venue narratives that help a, a guest understand the room that they're in and connect the room that they're in with the food and beverage offering. Um, again, turning a bar and restaurant into an experience. We, I design, I work with interior designers to make a venue, a bar, work ergonomically and effectively. A bar is the one of two revenue generating centers in a bar and restaurant. Revenue comes in through the restaurant, i.e. guests enjoying food, and through the bar, guests enjoying drinks. These are the two revenue and profit centers for a hospitality business. Yes, you could layer in sponsorships or deals or pouring, I get it. But really, you need bums on restaurant seats and you need bums on bar seats. If putting money 
in the cash registers of either the restaurant or the bar has limitations or barriers or steps or processes that slow that transaction down, i.e. making a cocktail behind a bar because of poor bar design is harder work and more touches than it needs to be, then call me, we'll come in, we'll redesign the bar. I like to come in on the ground floor. I like to come into projects that are at the blueprint stage and I like to work with interior designers and owners to produce an ergonomically efficient revenue center for a bar and restaurant operation. Got it. Awesome. Dude, this has been a lot of fun, man. Thank you so much for taking the time to figure out how we're going to record this. Jumping around Los Angeles, finding a venue. We made it happen. I want to ask a couple more questions. We're going to wrap it up. Uh, what is one thing about your business, a value, a process, a system that makes you truly unstoppable? That is a great question. What makes Carson Co. truly unstoppable? I, I have an answer. We really, <laughs> we really care. And I don't know, I don't know if that translates well enough. We want to work with people we want to work with. That's what we want to work with us. We want to do great work and have fun doing it. That's what makes us truly unstoppable. I love it. The mission statement is to change the world by inspiring, empowering, and transforming the industry. How have you personally transformed? How are you a better man today than the man you were when you started in this industry? Um, I was a, I was a 17 year old kid. I am now a 47 year old adult who truly knows himself. I know, I know what I've contributed to the hospitality sector in my own tiny way. I know that I am so fortunate to love what I do. People often talk about being rich. I'm not, I, I'm rich, but not, not in the dollars and cents definition. I'm rich because my life is rich. Time. I'm, I, the people around purpose, me. Thank relationships. You. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I, I I can tick all of those boxes, you know. I, I on and that I feel list of freedoms, so I think, fortunate. It's yeah. just such a. I've worked my ass off to have it, and it's it's not a dollars and cents thing. I, it's really not. Seventy eighty have, thousand have, a year is what they say you need to make in order to really have choose financial freedom. Seventy eight grand. Seventy I, to eighty I, thousand, depending on where you live. I'm going to challenge that because I had I I learned a new Gen Z um, acronym. Hi-fi, high income financial instability, or oh, insecurity. Sorry. Well, yeah. Hi-fi. The so hi-fi is now like, but like, you're on six figures and you can't. You you still feel like it's not enough. Like it's well, weird. what lifestyle are you living? Well, and what, are you valuing relationships? Thank you. Purpose. I was about to bring that back around. And time. Great. Are you in great provocation. Status. You know. So. I, for me, I've said it on this podcast already. I, retirement for me means never talking about money again. That right. doesn't mean having millions or billions. That's not, that's not the goal. The goal is to continue to love the skin I'm in, love the person I am, know that I am doing the level best I can for the, for the, for the things that make me happy and doing it again the next day. If you got the news, you'd be leaving this world tomorrow. Yeah. All the memories of you, your work, and your restaurants, and your businesses would be lost with your departure, with the exception of three pieces of wisdom. You could leave behind for the good of humanity and your legacy. What would those three pieces of wisdom be? It's not important. One. Would be one. Feedback is a gift, for sure. Two. Sleep well at night knowing you've been the best version of yourself that day. Three. This has been a lot of fun, John. Thank you so I much. I really man. had to think about that, man. No, Thank you did you. great. Really I put good. you on the spot. Um, so the only other questions I have for you. One, I found you by having somebody call you out. And um, the whole reason why I'm living this lifestyle... Uh, is so that I can find, I can follow up, I can use word of mouth, the most trusted form of marketing out there. 
to find people, to make an example of. This is the ice bucket challenge, right? Who do you respect <laughs> and admire? Really, like, who's fiscally responsible? Who takes care of their people? Who are the people that we that deserve to be made an example of but aren't trying to find, aren't trying to look for the media? They just want to do what they want to fucking do and be good at what they do. Who is that person? It, can I can I give two answers? You can give me as many as you want. Oh, shit. I've, there's... A, there's Quite a few. You can follow up afterwards. It doesn't have to be on air. No, no, no. It can be. It can be on air because I. I okay. So first of all, is one one of my one of my absolute heroes. A guy called Andres Masso, Dre Masso. Hunt him down. I have a podcast with him. He he trained me as a bartender at Lab. One of my dearest friends, who I love and respect the most. If you hadn't already been sent to me by Ross Simon, I would have said that douchebag, um, who I love. Then. Number two is a hospitality titan duo. Eric Alprin and Angus McShane. Okay. I will happily make those introductions, um, but those two need a podcast together. Okay. Not solo. Are they're, they, they're, uh, they're Cheech and Chong nice. in our industry, and I, I love them dearly. Um, I, I'd love to shout out Sasha Richardson, who is just one of the most incredible humans in our industry um, and then my business partner Emily yeah. Emily Weldon she's a magician yeah. you know we, we have very different skill sets and career experiences but because our because they're so different they're symbiotic you know we are, we are cheating we yeah. are yin and yang those are the best um, partners people who aren't like you but the complete opposite and challenge you to be the best yeah. version of yourself every day yeah and 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 lift you up and celebrate you and provoke you and push you oh, and we, we are those for each other so john how those can are, we, those are how can we connect with you if we've really enjoyed today's conversation uh, thank you um social media i'm johnny's world j-o-h-n-n-i-e-s world everywhere so insta facebook Threads. Is that your Facebook group that you're promoting this uh, group yeah, to? Yeah. yeah. So you can come find me on Facebook. Um, John Gakuru, G-A-K-U-R-U. Johnny's World everywhere. Um, I'd love to connect. If anybody is so inspired to reach out, I always have an open door. If anyone is in, in the LGBTQIA plus community that is feels at risk or doesn't have anyone that they feel comfortable or safe to talk to, I... I offer whatever it is that I am and whatever it is I have to give to those folks. And that means a lot to me. John, this is when I say, man, thank you so much. And that there is no questioning. You are unstoppable. You. Cheers.